Well, I know we're on a tight time schedule today, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, Ralph, would you like to start us off? Yes, um, good afternoon, folks. Um, so welcome to this uh, webinar that uh, ICER is, uh, the Institute uh, for Social and Economic Research is sponsoring. Um, as some of you probably know, uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage uh, has been broadly involved in uh, helping the state, uh, the uh, municipality and other organizations respond to the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, some of those are, are some of those contributions from UAA are, are pretty widely known, like the contact tracing uh, training. Um, UAA has also contributed a, a good deal of what might be think of, we might think of as background uh, sort of work, uh, helping the state and the municipality understand uh, the, the responses that people are making uh, to the pandemic and how their policies are affecting uh, uh, folks in the community. So the opportunity today is to introduce four individuals or teams who uh, were involved in some of that work with the state and with uh, the municipality. Uh, this is actually the first of two seminars. There'll be another seminar um, also noon to one on uh, the fourth Thursday in February, February uh, 25th. And that'll be posted on the website uh, shortly. Uh, one, one housekeeping, Bit that I'll uh, mention before we, uh, I turn it over to, to Katie. And that is that in this seminar, we are using the Q&A button at the bottom of the page to handle uh, questions. <clears throat> I should say that we're on a fairly tight schedule. We do have uh, four teams or individuals to present and we do need to be done uh, right at one o'clock <clears throat> because several of the panelists uh, have another meeting at one o'clock. We will try to address uh, the questions that are in the Q and A, uh, but given the time frame, it, uh, it it may not be necessary. It may not be possible to get to all of those questions. If there's some time at the end, we'll circle around and, and uh, take care of those. So, with that preliminary, uh, let me introduce Dr. Katie Cueva. Uh, Katie is an assistant professor of health policy uh, in the Center for Behavioral Health uh, Research and Services, a center within uh, ICER. And so, Katie, do you want to? take over, introduce uh, the other panelists and uh, start the presentations. Absolutely, well, thank you, Ralph, for getting us started. So as he mentioned, we're on a tight time schedule today. There's four different groups presenting. And I've been a part of some of the COVID-19 work, but today's presentation, I get to mostly do some emceeing and keeping us on track. So we're gonna start off with information on COVID-19 surveys done in the municipality of Anchorage. Then we'll transition to over to surveys and interviews done in rural Alaska. And then some work by Dr. Barry and information on COVID-19 in Bristol Bay to follow up. Uh, we'll take questions as we go along. So please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I'll try to monitor that as well. Um, and if we have time at the end, we'll have some additional time for questions and answers, but we'll see how things go. Uh, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Mapai, are you two ready to present? And we're all set. And, and Gabe, did you want to go ahead and share our slides with the rest of the group? I'm unable to do so from my end, so thank you. We are ready, and if you allow me, I could share my screen. I think I'm able to do that, so can everybody see the screen? Looks good. All right, go ahead, Joy. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Joy Chavez Mapai, Professor of Journalism and Public Communications, and I am the co-PI of the Survey Research Project. Dr. Garcia is the PI of the project. On the research team, we have Rebecca Van Wick, Dr. K Katie Cueva, Dr. Elizabeth Schneider, Dr. Jennifer Meyer, and Dr. Jenny Miller. Next slide, please, Kate. And so um, really, uh, the surveys happen to be um, two parts to it. Uh, we've started to form the research team back in April, and then uh, the formal research contract came through in May, and, and that was really supposed to go only until, until early August. But then the municipality saw a need, given the pandemic, to continue to do the research project. And so basically, we extended that research co uh, contract from late August to now May 2021 of this year. The municipality wanted us to approach it in two ways. Alaska Survey Research would do the data collection. And uh, after that, a UAA would then um, be in charge of the questions, the design, the data analysis, and the recommendations. Next slide, please. 
we had three specific aims for this project. The first one really was about identifying and tracking knowledge, attitudes, behaviors um, related to uh, the mitigation and pre prevention of COVID-19 among Anchorage residents. And really, this was, these were questions about hand washing, distancing, engagement in COVID uh, risk behaviors. And really, these questions change uh, along with the different phases of the pandemic um, and the number of cases going up and down. As much as possible, we tried to anticipate uh, the communications needs and messaging needs of the municipality. And uh, next slide, please. For the second aim of this project, uh, we were to provide public health education and communication recommendations and strategies related to the prevention and mitigation of COVID-19 among minority populations in Anchorage. And really this was about um, helping to identify some of the needs of underserved populations in the community. And so we knew that the population-based survey as well as the panel surveys might not fully capture the different needs um, ha happening in our community. And so that was the, the purpose of the needs assessment. Next slide, please. The third aim of this uh, survey research project is to provide consultation and evaluation of the municipality's communication strategies. Uh, really boiled down to the fact that are these messages and strategies effective in terms of mitigation and response related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. And so um, we had a, both a mix of phone and panel surveys. And then again, UAA was tasked with questions and survey design. Alaska Survey Research in charge of collecting the data. And from there, we took the data, we uh, did survey analysis and we did data analysis, provided a brief report to the municipality. And then those findings uh, would be shared among certain groups. Now, next slide, please. So really, you, you won't be able to see this, but you'll find this in um, on the data site for the municipality. Um, and what it is, we produced 15 of these reports. And these were the brief reports that were provided to the municipality um, uh, from the panel surveys and from the phone surveys. And one of those uh, recommendations, and um, here we'll, we provided key findings as well as recommendations related to communication, to strategy, and one of the key findings that, um, and recommendations we had, next slide please, was to create um, an, an integrated communications team. Um, they had a separate team when the, pandem when the pandemic first began um, that was really um, the emergency operations center and they were tasked with that. But we saw a need for an integrated communications team that included not only the municipality of Anchorage Communications, but Alaska DHSS, uh, the Anchorage Health Department, the Emergency Operations Center, as well as the, uh, the media vendor, the marketing agency, Northwest Strategies. And what we really tried to do during this was have the strategies and communication um, informed by the data. And, and that's really the purpose of the uh, communication, the integrated communications team. Next slide, please. Later on, the state also saw a need for an integrated COVID um, communications team, and that involved the contact tracing team, uh, public information team, uh, brilliant media strategies, along with uh, Thompson & Co, and Blueprint uh, Media and Advocacy. And the, the municipal brief findings were shared with uh, the integrated communications teams for both the municipality, as well as the state, as well as the mayor's uh, communications um, and, and staff in general. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, those teams, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine leads also made use of the data provided by the UAA research team. The vaccine team uh, was separate from the two integrated communications team. And then the uh, Google, Apple, ENX COVID-19 exposure notification app team also made use of the data that we provided. And next slide, please. So there, we have now 15 surveys later. We started with our phone survey, which was about, uh, the end there was just under 1,000. And from the phone surveys, what we would do then is we would ask them at the end of the phone survey, would you be interested in taking part in panel surveys uh, related to uh, questions regarding COVID-19 and the municipality's response? And there you see the series of panel surveys that followed the phone surveys. And then after we would check back in, with the phone, with another phone survey. And from that phone survey, we would then ask, would you be interested in taking part in a panel survey? And we would have a, an additional phone survey on top of that. 
Um, so we continue to do this and provide the brief reports to the municipality. And really the data was what we needed to sort of inform the mitigation and the response. We knew early on there was widespread support for the mask ordinance. Um, even though there was loud opposition from a small group, we knew there was wide support for wearing masks in the municipality of Anchorage. We knew going into the holidays that people were going to gather and people were not engaging um, in more vigilant mitigation behaviors. And then we knew that there was a needed uh, a, a need for the hunker down order, given uh, what we were seeing related to the gatherings and the people's intentions going into the holiday season. So there are 15 surveys uh, later, um, lots of data and information. And um, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Garcia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joy. So I'll just present to you some highlights of our uh, surveys uh, that we've conducted. And as Joy mentioned, uh, we've, been, we've produced uh, 15 brief reports so far, and there are more surveys um, that are going to be, are planned to be conducted uh, soon. Um, so I'm just providing you some screenshots of the uh, various findings that we have. Um, this is specifically from our latest brief report. Uh, we looked at um, whether people wear masks, whether they're watching their distance or whether they're washing their hands. And as you can see there on your screen, for the most part, um, Anchorage residents are wearing their mask. Most of them are wearing their mask. Most of them are washing their hands every time. And uh, most of them are uh, watching their um, distance. So, um, and we've seen, um, Increases in, in, in mask wearing specifically when, when the um, emergency order to uh, wear mask was um, implemented. We also ask questions um, whether people are avoiding uh, the three C's, crowded places, close contact settings, and confined and enclosed spaces. Um, and as you can see there on your screen, um, there, uh, less than half of our the respondents have um, have been avoiding physical contact of any kind with with uh, someone outside of their household, and that um, less than twenty percent, at least in December, are um, are were in enclosed spaces or crowded places. So, uh, really positive findings uh, that we're finding, at least from our latest brief report. But we have some areas of concerns. Uh, those significantly less likely to avoid the three C's that I just showed you uh, were those who self-identify as poli politically conservative and those who are essential workers. Um, those significantly more likely to be in the bar, shake someone's hands, or be in a gathering of 10 or more people uh, include those who self-identify as politically conservative, those who had a uh, less than $80,000 annual household income. And finally, those significantly less likely to get COVID-19 vaccine uh, were those who self-identify as politically conservative. We have some noteworthy findings from our latest brief report. We found that 53% of the respondents were aware of the difference between quarantine and isolation. So definitely we need to um, increase that. Um, and the top three reasons respondents were not willing to get COVID-19 vaccine were, number one, they felt that the vaccine will have negative health effects. Um, two, that they would like to wait until other people took the vaccine. And third is they just didn't trust the vaccine would be effective. So just a little bit more about the needs assessment that we conducted with underserved population. Uh, we conducted a needs assessment via phone and online with the help of our community partners. Um, and we conducted this uh, early in June, all the way to July, and more than 750 participated in our survey. Uh, around 246 um, immigrants and refugees, uh, 163 non-immigrant racial ethnic minorities, and 93 um, people with disabilities. Our, Key findings for this specific needs assessment survey was that um, immigrants and refugees and people with disabilities were more likely to engage in COVID-19 uh, related protective behaviors. 
uh, such as mask wearing, watching your distance, et cetera, compared with their counterparts. Um, most of the respondents reported high levels of worry in terms of their household finances, losing employment, and having uh, self or members of their family members being affected by COVID. Uh, most people with disabilities also report high levels of stress. Uh, for the most part, um, are the respondents for this needs assessment, uh, their preferred way of receiving information include the internet, t television, texting, and email. So after we conducted the uh, needs assessment, we then went back to the community and asked the community whether our brief report, uh, whether our um, needs assessment findings um, are consistent with what they're experiencing and seeing in their household or in their, in their community. Um, the com the com community forms that we conducted were with immigrants and refugees, Alaska Native elders, uh, Latinx and Wongs, uh, with the help of, of, again of our community liaisons from those communities. And we recently completed a brief report related to our community forum. Um, and what we found uh, were that community forums suggest that the findings from our needs assessment survey were for the most part consistent with what is being experienced in the communities of interest. Um, and there were areas of need or concern that were not captured in the needs assessment that we conducted. Uh, this include the need for translation services when, access, uh, when accessing the two-on-one services and the difficulty of social distancing and wearing masks, especially among those in the disability community. Um, and uh, the increased need for uh, vaccine, availab uh, vaccine availability for these underserved communities. In terms of our next steps, um, as I alluded to earlier, there are more surveys that are going to be conducted. Actually, two surveys after, after the 15th survey that um, I showed you a while ago on the screen. Uh, two more panel surveys were conducted and a few more are going to be conducted until uh, mid-March. Um, and we are also transitioning to our AIM-3 that Joy mentioned, and that's um, providing consultation and evaluation of the municipality's communication strategies um, that relates to message development and evaluation, creating test messages and graphics. Uh, we're actually conducting focus groups and um, in, in our focus group, this, in our in our plan for focus groups, we're actually partnering with um, JBear. Uh, and I believe that uh, the next time we do a presentation for the next uh, next segment, uh, for the next um, time we participate in this, we'll, we'll, we'll go into more details about our findings in our specific AIM-3. And so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And we have time for just one or two questions. If any of our attendees have a question, I believe you can unmute yourself or you could type into that question and answer chat box. I know it was so clear that we probably don't have any questions, but if you think of any, feel free to type it into that chat box as we move along and I'll keep an eye there. And we'll transition over to some work by Dr. Fried and Dr. Han talking about COVID-19 surveys and interviews in rural Alaska. Sorry, I lost my mute button for a minute there. Okay, can everyone see my slides okay? They look good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for organizing this session. It's we were saying the other day that over the summer we had a lot of communication among all of the UAA groups, and then um, as the academic year went on, that this is that sort of waned. So it's cool to hear um, updates on everything. Um, so Ruby and I are faculty at the Institute for Circumpolar Health Studies, and we're here to share a very small snapshot in this ten minutes of a project that we're working on with our collaborator Laura Eichelberger, who's a medical anthropologist at ANTHC. And the three of us have a half hour presentation at Alpha at 1.45, I believe, this afternoon, if you want to hear more. And also, we've received input from a number of people as we've developed our research questions, um, Patricia Cochran, some of our research assistants, a number of others at ANTHC and CDC Arctic Investigations, folks working in remote Alaskan communities. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all of these contributors before we get going. Okay, so let me find our 
on it in advance. All right, so many of the COVID-19 updates and studies have been about the number of new cases, hospital capacity, and vaccine rates. Um, while these are really important data for characterizing the global pandemic, they just don't capture the whole story. Um, and the goal of this project is really to understand what's happening on the ground in remote Alaskan communities, people's lived experiences, um, and also learning how COVID-19 is impacting daily life across Alaska and how people are responding. So before we move into the presentation, we just wanted to share a dedication of our research and our hope that this work will help capture the long lasting impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic um, that, will, that will occur within um, all of our Alaskan communities. So more than 60,000 people live in remote Alaskan communities and we're defining this as um, communities off of the road system. Um, and it looks like we have a lot of Alaskans here today, so I don't need to tell you that there's, it's a unique eco-social context in these communities that means that the COVID-19 pandemic is really unfolding differently here than it is in, in Anchorage or Fairbanks, for example. Um, in this study, we're using a combination of semi-structured key informant interviews and also multiple waves of a statewide survey of remote Alaskan communities, not unlike what Gabe and Joy just presented. So we were just, Ruby and I were thinking, um, just we've chatted about it before, but it'll be really interesting to sort of compare what we're finding in our rural um, surveys with what's going on here in Anchorage. So um, in today's presentation, we're going to focus on it, like I said, a tiny snapshot looking at vaccine perceptions and concerns among um, community members. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, vaccine concerns that we uh, found in our, our survey. And then Ruby's gonna talk a little bit about some open-ended questions that we had around, um, around concerns to get a little bit more um, detail and perspective on, on what was giving people um, concern. So we had a statewide survey that we implemented in REDCap. We recruited through Facebook and community contacts Participants had to be 18 years of age and live in a community off the road system. And this survey was conducted between early November and mid-December, which was before the first um, vaccine was approved for use in uh, the United States. And around vaccine perceptions, we had six questions and there's a, a number of other questions on the surveys that were very similar to a lot of the ones that um, Gabe and Joy just presented. So thanks for setting us up on that front. Um, we had 113 participants from 34 remote Alaskan communities. The mean age was around 43, and most of our participants were female. Approximately half were Alaska Native. Um, and this slightly overrepresented the 25 to 54 year old age group. Our sample is a little bit young, um, as well as a slightly higher perception, uh, percentage of Alaska Natives compared to the population in remote Alaska. This is the distribution of our survey responses. So you can see that we received responses from most regions around the state, which was really um, helpful. And we analyzed the responses um, to a series of five questions about vaccine acceptance. So we basically, um, we asked participants if a COVID vaccine were available for, or if a COVID vaccine were available, would you get a vaccine for yourself, your children, your parents, other family members, or your friends? and respondents could choose um, a response on a five point Likert scale. They could say, yes, I would definitely get a vaccine for my children. I would probably get a vaccine. I would, uh, maybe not sure, probably not, or definitely not. Um, and then for the analysis, we actually combined these um, and we looked at the folks who said definitely or probably, the folks who expressed uncertainty and the folks who said probably not, definitely not. So this figure summarizes the results of all five questions. So starting at the bottom, we found that over half of respondents gave positive responses. Um, I don't know if you can see, I'll do a little pointer here. So down, starting at the bottom, here we go. We found um, that over half of respondents gave positive responses when asked um, about getting the vaccine to all of the groups except for their children. So that's this light blue bar here. Approximately 47% said they would definitely or probably get a vaccine for their children. Between 25 and 30% of respondents expressed uncertainty about whether they would get a vaccine for themselves, friends, or family members. And less than one fifth of respondents said they would probably or definitely not get a vaccine for all groups except for their children. It was a slightly higher percentage, about 24% said that they would not get a vaccine for their children. Then we looked at a number of demographic associations with vaccine acceptance. Um, we looked at associations with age, 
income, education, and race. In these univariate analyses, we found a significant difference in vaccine acceptance between Alaska Native and non-Alaska Native respondents. Alaska Native participants were less likely to respond that they would definitely or probably get a vaccine for themselves or their parents. And approximately 70% of non-Alaska Native respondents expressed a high likelihood of getting a vaccine for themselves compared to, to only 47% in Alaska Native respondents. And that distribution was similar when we were asked about parents. Um, while a higher percentage of non-Alaska Native respondents said they would likely get a vaccine for their children compared to Alaska Native respondents, this difference was not significant. So again, we saw differences by race, but only when asked about getting a vaccine for yourself um, or your parents. We also found significant differences in vaccine acceptance by age. Respondents between 25 and 55, 54 years of age expressed more hesitancy, hesitancy about getting a COVID vaccine for themselves, their children, other family members, and their friends compared to the youngest age group, the 18 to 24 year olds. Um, in contrast, the folks over 65 universally uh, responded that they would probably or definitely get the COVID vaccine for any family member or friends. Um, and there were no significant differences by sex, income, education, or uh, a COVID impact score that I didn't address today, but I will talk about in our presentation this afternoon. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ruby and she can talk a little bit about our um, open-ended responses. Great, thank you, Micah. Um, so we also included an open-ended question after these vaccine uh, multiple choice questions to really get at some of the um, general concerns that people might have if they responded um, definitely not, or maybe you're unsure, or even if they said yes. <laughs> um, so we asked, do you have any concerns about getting a COVID vaccine for yourself or your family members? And if so, what are they? And <clears throat> we coded the um, responses using inductive analysis um, and we had 113 responses here as well. So if um, you combine, um, so there were 10 people who said explicitly that they had no concerns getting the vaccine, but there were also 39 people who just left that um, box blank on the survey. So depending on how you want to interpret that, that is up to 43% of respondents that had no or, or little concerns related to their, uh, to getting a vaccine. Um, although we can't really say that um, with certainty because no answer is a no answer. It's not necessarily saying that they have no concern. But um, we did have quite a few concerns related to safety. And actually, as I was watching um, Dr. Garcia's presentation, they definitely um, echo um, both what they're finding in Anchorage, but also um, are very similar to results in the rest of the lower 48 as well. So we have over a third of the participants um, said that they had concerns about safety. And these included unknown side effects, um, which 20% of, um, of total respondents said that they were concerned with unknown side effects especially long-term ones. Eight were concerned with a perceived lack, lack of sufficient testing of the vaccine, and others kind of had unspecified safety concerns or issues with the per perceived rushed production of the vaccines. Um, some of these issues were also found to be related to concerns about the efficacy of the vaccine with about 9% of the respondents citing insufficient testing rush production and other unspecified concerns related to efficacy. Um, seven of the 113 respondents voiced issues with trust related to the vaccine, which included mistrust in politicians, although they weren't specific about which politicians they were talking about. Um, outsider involvement related to vaccine administration and distribution and others who were generally mistrustful of the vaccine and weren't more specific beyond that. Um, distribution was um, a little bit different than uh, the findings in Anchorage, which makes sense because um, distribution into, to remote Alaskan communities 
is obviously a much more tricky um, issue. Um, it was just as common of an issue um, as the, uh, the lack of trust with three participants specifically stating that they were concerned with fair and efficient distribution to remote Alaska and two stating they were concerned with children getting the vaccine. And then some other main concerns that we found were people wanting to just wait and see, just like uh, Dr. Garcia found, um, and deciding about whether or not to get the vaccine until they had kind of seen what their friends and family had experienced. And also stating that they are unwilling to get vaccinated with any vaccines. Um, okay, and Katie's telling me it's time to wrap it up. So our next steps are <laughs> that we're gonna continue with a second round of uh, uh, surveys to really try to document changes as well as get in um, more in-depth information on some of these um, subtopics listed here. And then I just wanted to thank again, um, Laura Eichelberger and um, obviously Patric Patricia Cochran and others who have been um, very helpful in this project. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. Appreciate you sharing your work. Dr. Barry, you're up next. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to talk and share some of the stuff I've been spending the last uh, I guess a year now thinking about, and a little bit before that for some of these projects. I think y'all can see my slides, so I'm gonna keep chugging along. I wanted a more formal title that tied everything together, and then I just realized the real answer is just what has Kevin been up to in the last year? Um, and so I'm gonna go with that. Uh, I started off in the pandemic by doing a little bit of uh, bio or sort of epidemiological modeling early on, trying to figure out what an uncontrolled pandemic in Alaska would look like. And this work has kind of continued in a bit of an un informal capacity sense, uh, looking at how different r naughts different recovery rates, and different ending to different restrictions would uh, lead to the dynamics of the pandemic to change. So this is a sample from a report I put together uh, back in February or March um, that I've been every once in a while updating ever since to see what would happen as we lift restrictions. Um, and I, I continued to do this kind of work throughout the pandemic. Uh, so I also produced a report that looked a bit at the, the costs and benefits of lockdowns in Anchorage. So this particular work was modeled on a paper done by my, my former grad school advisor and co-author Dave Finoff at the University of Wyoming, uh, and Jason Shogren, who's a Rasmussen chair in the econ department at UAA, or a former Rasmussen chair, he spends time up here. Um, but we they had looked at what the difference in transmission rates and then what the negative economic impact of a pandemic uh, would be nationwide. And so I replicated that study focusing on Alaska itself and particularly Anchorage. Uh, so I took a, an estimate of the lost GDP Alaska wide from early in the pandemic uh, from ICER's Musin Gitabi of $4 billion and kind of assumed, okay, what if all of those costs are just in Anchorage, which of course I know it's a very Anchorage person thing to say, what if all the costs are in Anchorage and nowhere else matters? Um, but I only produced this report for Anchorage and nobody else is supposed to see it. So, you know, that's fine. Um, and then I estimated the, the net benefits of reduced mortality from those orders. Uh, and for this, I tried to calibrate things to activity data from SafeGraph and Google Mobility to estimate what the, reduce, the reduction in uh, transmission coefficients should be based on the change in the amount of times people people spent away from their home. And based on a VSL and a mortality rate that was in hindsight too high because it was early on in the pandemic, I found roughly $40 billion in avoided deaths to date from the mandates at that point. Uh, with the, the interesting thing from this big this figure being if you ended the hunker down early, we rapidly responded or rapidly returned to an uncontrolled outbreak, which in hindsight seemed to be pretty close to true. Um, and even with the lower mortality rate, I've gone back and updated the sense and the cost benefit analysis is still positive. Uh, restrictions are better than an uncontrolled outbreak, which I think is intuitive to people who value human life, um, which is a lot of economists, some of them. Uh, but it also uh, came up with a couple key takeaways in this earlier report that I've been kind of proud of, that at least I didn't get it completely wrong. First off, that Alaskans have meaningfully changed their behavior and it showed up in the data early on that we weren't seeing what an uncontrolled outbreak should have looked like, but instead saw significantly lower or not, probably as a result of our, our colleagues in the College of Health and Department of Health at the state and city level, or the 
you know, state and city levels. Um, and that, but it also um, came up with, you know, we were potentially undercounting cases without enough testing and that the economy wouldn't immediately recover even as we sort of reopened industries in the state. And this has been a repeat story that, yeah, we've, we've reduced restrictions, we've lifted some restrictions, but the economy has still just been slow. And part of this is Alaska's unique um, in some very specific ways. Um, I have two minutes. Oh, I have five. I'm combining my five minutes uh, from this one and the next one. But the next part too is uh, I had this cell phone driven data analysis that I worked on with my uh, colleagues, Eli Fenichel, Jude Bayan, and Greg Gonsalves, where we looked at r naught and its various distributions across the country, did that for every county in the US and tried to look at where restrictions were working. Uh, I was pretty widespread. I will still get there though. And I also designed a new course if anybody's interesting as well, interested as well. So Econ 390 Pandemic Economics. Um, I, I wrote this early on in the pandemic and have been updating it ever since. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and so we cover a lot of the same content that I've been doing research on, including modeling the outbreak, uh, thinking about the trade-offs between hunkering down and socially distancing and increased case counts, reopening. And then one of the more exciting lectures I've ever given, given is focused on, for instance, the, uh, the inequality of COVID um, and gender inequality, racial inequality, income inequality, and how this has impacted different people. Uh, taking a breath, I guess I've been busy all this last year. I've also been a part of a, a CNH grant that was focused in the East Coast in New York on the threat of Lyme disease. And we happened to be running a survey over the summer. So we added a couple of questions to ask how uh, COVID-19 was impacting people emotionally and how they were responding by changing their outdoor activity. We found that people on the East Coast, consistent with Alaska as well, spent more time outdoors, but they also changed where they spent their time. Uh, more folks there were spending time in their sort of their backyard, very local areas, and less time in public green spaces, which is kind of the opposite of what we expect in Alaska, where our public green spaces are much less crowded. Um, and so that's being submitted and hopefully going to be published. Uh, and then I also did some work with Peter Dashak and uh, other colleagues, including Finoff and Haranigan. Uh, looking at how to prevent the next possible COVID-19 pandemic. So Peter is the president of EcoHealth Alliance, who does a lot of preventive public health work, um, particularly concerning COVID or, um, coronaviruses in China. They were working on COVID before it was cool. And our paper here mostly focuses, so we, we boil this down to sort of boilerplate economics, but just that there is incentive to invest in preventing pandemics before they occur. Um, and that it makes sense to have excess hospital capacity, excess testing capacity, and well-funded public health programs um, above and beyond what the return is. And so there's some economies here on the right, but above and beyond what the return is just day-to-day -day from public health stuff. So we're not spending enough even to fight things like obesity and addiction, but then we should be spending even more beyond that. And um, that we could double the size or triple the size of well-known programs like the Seattle flu study and still make a positive economic return in expected reduced future damages. Which again, sorry for the economies, it's uh, unavoidable. And then I've also got two other surveys that are out that I have not uh, worked on yet in great extent that hopefully one day I'll get to. And then the, the last stuff I wanna chat about, which is sort of a lead in for Hannah and Lance is that uh, we also got a, a NSF rapid project um, where my part of the project has been developing a model of a potential COVID-19 outbreak in Dillingham uh, with also looking to other uh, coastal Alaska regions where fishing is a big deal, where there are large processing facilities and fishing fleets at dock. And so this is a simple diagram of the, the model over here where we've got a fishing fleet, um, a community where people spend time, processing plants where people are very close together. And then this is a picture of somebody's home because I thought it'd be awkward in a small community to show a picture of somebody's house in Dillingham, because I assume that would be distracting if I ever showed it to anybody from there. Um, but basically people in the model interact between these two groups and the outcomes are really that uh, the contact rates between groups are help determine how quickly the disease spreads, but also that the, the small locations can amplify and speed up the outbreak within, within areas. So within either households, processors, or boats. And we replicated this again in what's called an agent-based model, where we got rid of sort of the, the SIR dealing with averages stuff. And instead, myself and a collaborator at the University of Tampa, uh, Aaron Wood, programmed an agent-based model where we created individuals. So individuals who work in processing plants, uh, who are fishermen, or who are residents, and then simulated an outbreak that started in one of these three different locations. And not only are people 
part of these groups now, but they're also part of individual processing plants or individual fishing boats or individual households. And so one of the neat things that came out of this model is that A, we, we again see the, the key importance between mixing within and between groups, but also that it's possible to squash and catch outbreaks within one location. And so my favorite figure uh, that I've made in the last month probably is this one right here, uh, the processor susceptible infected and removed individual, individuals. So it's on the bottom left. Uh, where the, the green line here is people who are susceptible to the disease, which is always declining because uh, people um, just get sick and move into the next group. The next group is people who are infected and they're red. And then the blue group is people who have had the disease and are now resistant or removed. And we simulated outbreaks over basically a 60 day and 50 day season. And so what you can see here is that within the processing facilities, we can see localized outbreaks. So this is with four processing facilities that each have a population of 50 workers which is an abstraction for the model purpose. But if you can stop the spread between facilities, you have this natural stop um, where, where you can have an outbreak that completely overwhelms a single facility, but the others are left untouched. And if you can limit the amount of mixing between groups. And this is really neat because it matches what we've seen with policy in Bristol Bay, where we've seen restrictions on workers and fishermen and sort of mixing between both boats and, between, and processing plants and also mixing between groups too. So it's been nice that the model supports some of the policy stuff that's been done there. And so, oh uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I've managed to get done um, as well as some other stuff, but that's un-COVID related. So thank you for the opportunity to share. It's exciting to see everybody again. And sorry for talking super fast. No worries, thank you. That was really interesting. You've been up to quite a bit. Well, I will turn it over to the last presenters, um, Dr. Howe, Dr. Henninghausen, you guys are up next. Hi, thanks, thanks for having us. Um, I'm just gonna turn it over to Hannah. She's um, going to talk about our project and um, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions if, if anything comes up. So I assume you can see my screen and hear me. If you can't, let me know. Um, okay, so uh, just what Kevin was alluding to, uh, or not alluding to, was talking about, um, I'm going to talk about this project that's funded by a Rapid Response National Science Foundation grant. It's made up of a conglomeration of a few universities, so UAA, we've got Kevin, myself, Lance, and Aaron Wood, who's also at University of Tampa. At Penn State, we've got two researchers, and at UAF, there are two researchers. So one part of this grant is Kevin's work. And another part of this grant is a survey that we conducted in, Brist in the Bristol Bay fishing industry and adjacent, meaning the surrounding community during COVID. Um, so the broader aims of the grant um, and the survey were to better understand the costs, benefits and effectiveness of COVID mitigation policies, as well as better understanding the decision-making under risk that various groups do. Um, so those groups could include, for example, residents, non-residents, uh, captains, crew, uh, people not involved in the fishing industry, whatever it is. And why do we care about Bristol Bay? Well, there's really these two competing, um, these two competing uh, facts about Bristol Bay that um, sort of com complicate the discussion uh, surrounding COVID mitigation policies. The first is that the region is dependent on the $1.5 billion fishing industry canceling the season is just not a choice. Um, on the other hand, the largest hospital in the region only has 16 beds and two ventilators, meaning there is not a lot of support um, in Bristol Bay if there were a large outbreak. So the details of the survey are that um, it was designed in June 2020, in 2020 um, and co conducted online in July and August. We received about 926 valid responses, which is a lot. Um, and we were pretty excited about that. Um, and maybe part of the reason that we received so many responses is that people were emailed Amazon gift cards based on their response to a lottery question. And that lottery question is a question that's designed to, um, uh, to uh, estimate what your risk preference is. All right, so what kind of information did we collect? Well, there's lots of different researchers on this project and lots of people are looking at different things. So we uh, have a bunch of different questions, some about basic demographics, labor force information, health information, policy questions, and risk perceptions and preferences. 
So for example, uh, we learned that um, of the respondents that are from Alaska, most are from the Bristol Bay region, right? But actually that's about comparable to respondents to uh, from other parts in the US, other, uh, other states in the US other than Alaska. Um, most respondents work in the fishing industry. Respondents tended to be sort of 25 to 55 years old. Um, uh, most respondents have some college, uh, not too many have, let's say, graduate degrees, but most have some college. Um, and actually, most of these respondents have like four or five person households, right? So here you'll see that most respondents actually have um, two children. All right, so what I'm going to focus on in this five minutes I've left is the information about health. COVID-19 related policy questions and risk perceptions and preferences. And why is this useful? Well, first of all, for academia, for academia reasons, um, it's, it's good to know sort of domain specific risk preferences, um, for example, pandemic risk preferences and decision-making under risk. Um, and then in terms of policy, what preferences does the population have surrounding opening and closing the fishery? All right, so, um, my research mostly focuses on understanding how people make decisions under risk. So that's what I'm gonna focus on here. Um, and we approach this with this overarching question of do respondents think it is wise to open the commercial fishery during COVID? Respondents have to consider their economic risks, right? So potentially uh, their perceived probability and the magnitude of income loss say, and their health risks, which is the perceived probability and magnitude of reduced health. And you can also imagine that sometimes these overlap, right? So if you are not able to go to work, then you are not earning money. So that's another, um, if you're not able to go to work because of health, you're not earning money. So they do sometimes overlap. So people consider their economic risks and their health risks, risks and make decisions within the context of their domain specific risk preferences. And by risk preferences, I mean that they could be risk loving or they could be risk averse or they could be risk neutral. All right, so some questions um, some, uh, surrounding economic risks, let's say for crew members, for example, would be if you didn't work as a crew member, could you have found other employment this summer, right? People didn't really have, uh, people didn't feel strongly that they would definitely find employment this summer, but um, generally speaking, people would have been able to find employment this summer. However, revealed preference, they are working for the fishery um, and they do say that working for the fishery, they're able to make more money than other options. All right, so it was definitely in their economic benefit there uh, to work for the fishery monetarily. Now let's talk about health risks, right? They could get COVID, um, they could be exposed to COVID, they could contract COVID, COVID, and they could also have serious health complications. And generally speaking, people sort of tended to think that they would be exposed to COVID, that they would contract COVID if they were exposed, that's the middle graph. And on the right graph, that also they might have serious health complications. And that's pretty interesting, right? So you're really weighing these two economic and health risks against each other, right? Which one is more important? So crew members came to work for mostly for the summer, revealed preference. So it seems the potential benefits, right, of your income, say, outweigh the potential costs. Um, but can any of these this can any of this decision making be explained by risk preferences? Um, so we played this game essentially where you choose a, a certain gamble of um, where you definitely get money, right, but it's a lesser amount of money or they can choose an answer where they have the potential to get more money, but it's less certain, right? And if you choose to get more money, but it's less certain, that kind of means you're risk loving. And if you choose to get uh, certainly money, but less money, then you are risk averse. And we tend to see that people are more risk loving than risk averse. Um, on the crew members are more risk loving rather than risk averse. On the other hand, risk preferences are domain specific, right? So are they really risk loving when it comes to um, pandemic and health risks uh, rather than sort of just choosing, uh, choosing an amount? Um, and uh, 
And finally, we see that the extreme responses are more likely than middle responses. So that might have something to do with survey design. And finally, my favorite graphs are I'm going through this so quickly. Um, but this, I, I wanted to know, I examined the residents answered a question asking, do they think the fishery should open, right? Um, and then you can group that by risk preferences, right? So all the way on the left, that big red, those big red lines, that means that somebody is risk loving and all the way on the right, it means that they're risk averse. And we can see that residents who definitely think or who, who, sorry, we can see that residents who think that the fishery should not open or tend to think the fishery should not open, don't choose ex responses that are as extreme, right? And they tend to be more risk averse. Um, so I don't know, uh, maybe those types of people, I guess, uh, I guess the sort of open question is, is are people that, yeah, I mean, this sort of, let's say this supports the understand the conclusion that, um, that people who are more risk averse also think that the fishery shouldn't open. And with that, I will end. I'll just say that we're gonna have a second wave of the survey. We're gonna focus on vaccination preferences um, and revisit many of the questions that we've asked before. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your work with us. And I'm very impressed. We've kept quite close to time. So we have a few minutes here at the end if there are questions. Um, some of our folks have to head out in just a couple of minutes because they have presentations at one o'clock at Alpha, the Alaska Public Health Association Summit, myself included. So if you have any questions for our first speakers, um, Dr. Mapai, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Han, Dr. Freed, I would prioritize asking those sooner than later. And feel free to unmute yourself or to type it into that Q&A box. So we have a clarifying question on the survey asking, what do you get a vaccine for? Were you asking them the reasons they would get a vaccine to protect themselves, parents, children, or friends? Or were you asking them if they would encourage or help their parents, friends, and make sure their children got vaccinated since individuals can't get their friends actually vaccinated? Dr. Fried, Dr. Han, I think that one is for you guys. Could you say, oh, could you say that one more time, Katie? Sure. So it's also in the Q&A if you want to pop it up and read it. Um, but Dr. King is asking a clarifying question on the survey, asking the would you get a vaccine for question. Oh, so were you uh -huh. asking them for the reasons they would get a vaccine? Was it to protect themselves, to protect their kids? Right, thank you. Sorry. I thought that was, it was directed towards Hannah. Okay. So um, the question is just about your likelihood of actually getting the vaccine. So we didn't ask about the reasons why you would, or we basically the, the first set of questions is literally just, if a vaccine were available, would you get it for yourself on a scale of absolutely not to absolutely yes? Um, and then the next question was just open-ended for all of the questions. And it just said, do you have any concerns? If so, what are they? And so they could expound on sort of their their reasoning for answering the the particular probably or likelihood that they did on the vaccine questions, but it didn't ask for the reasons, yes or no, for each of the demographic groups independently. Does that answer your question, Dan? I think the question is the part about asking friends and family because an individual can't actually get their friends vaccinated. So it's if they would be willing for their friends to get vaccinated or if they would get them for their friends what, what that part was about. Sure. Sure. It's more about like recommending it for your friends. Is it something that you would be, um, that you would encourage them to get it essentially. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And one question that I had as well is on the, the sample itself. And this is for you guys as well while you're here. Um, since it sounds like it was a Facebook link that was posted, is there an assumption that that sample is representative? Um, and if not, what are the limitations of calculating statistical significance and confidence intervals on uh, answers from a sample that is not representative? Sure, yeah, I see that question in the 
in the chat and I'm happy to talk with you about it a little bit more after this session because I think this is going a little bit deeper than we have time for. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, so the I think the biggest bias in this in this recruitment method is essentially people's likelihood of seeing the survey um, and seeing the, the opportunity to participate. And so it's obviously limited to people either that were um, users of Facebook or also people forwarded out via community listservs, that type of thing. Um, and so it's not necessarily a demographic weighting. I think that needs to happen as more as thinking about the limitations of who might be responding to the who, um, to the survey. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to chat more afterwards. Thanks. And we have another question. And I'm actually about to head out for a presentation of my own. Um, could I invite Ralph for you to take over? Can you read that question in the chat? Yes, I can. So Thank this you is so a much. question uh, aimed at the last group, uh, actually to Hannah. And that was on that last presentation, on your presentation, how did the people account for people being more risk averse or risk loving online versus real life? Uh, do people feel more confident uh, behind a computer screen? Seems like a great question. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, it's a very imperfect science uh, to figure out how somebody's risk preference is, right? So we've got some sort of tools that we kind of turn to, like the one that um, we did in terms of asking people whether they want a sure amount or an unsure amount or whatever, right? Um, but like you said, it's, it's imperfect. Um, so uh, yeah, so we don't, we're not, you know, we're not sh sure exactly um, to what extent their answers there would line up to how risk averse or risk loving they are in real life. I think that's something that we'd want to consider for the next survey um, and uh, maybe take a look at that question again and see if we can get at that. Thank you so much. Is that, Hannah, is that something that, uh... I mean, your particular approach, I think, is fairly standard uh, for uh, applications in economics. Uh, is there a literature, has anyone actually generated an experiment to try to get at this, this question of being uh, the effect of the screen in terms of being anonymous? Yeah, uh, and, I think uh, that um, I would assume so. It's not something that I have Googled yet, which so I should do that. Uh, so I think that you, yeah, everybody raises a really good point. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I can imagine that, I mean, it's, it all goes back to the sort of domain specific risk preferences as well, right? Um, and how it doesn't, it's not constant across all types, but yeah, I think that's awesome. Thank you. Well, um, I'll thank all of you for uh, joining us. I really have to give the, uh, the uh, panelists a, a tremendous credit uh, having uh, chaired similar meetings at uh, professional conferences, it never gets done in the time allotted. So this is obviously an, an exceptional group to stick to the very tight schedule that we had. Again, there'll be a, a, another, ICE will be sponsoring another seminar in a month on uh, February 25th. Uh, that's a Thursday. It'll be the same time, uh, noon to one. And once again, it'll be posted on the ICE website. The information will be posted on the ICER website. So thank you very much for joining us. We're really pleased with the presentations and the opportunity to share what uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage is doing. Uh, obviously the university is an important resource for the community and emphasizing the role of having uh, the kind of capacity that the university has to support communities in unexpected ways is uh, really an important uh, function for the university. So thank you very much and have a good day.